The answer to 1984 is 33 AD. Hello, I hope everybody's having a great day. Um, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's an attempt to invade Israel by Gog and Magog, but God himself intervenes. The big question that's been debated for years is, who on earth is Gog and Magog? The dominant Christian view is that it's Russia, but I've not seen any evidence that convinces me that it's Russia. Now, I respect Chuck Misler greatly, but I have to critique his work because it doesn't hold up to scrutiny. In the following clip, he says that Russia is north of Israel. So those ancient labels are there to, to identify the peoples, okay. And of the north quarters, now in the Hebrew, this has actually been adjusted to be the extreme parts of the north. What's extreme, uh, north and extremely north of Israel? What we would call Russia today. So if we take a look at this, Magog is up there in the north, and these various tribes attempt an invasion of Israel. But God is going to intervene to thwart this thing. Well, no it isn't. If we look at a map like this one, and find Jerusalem here, and put in a, a vertical line upwards, you might think that Moscow, the capital city of Russia, here, is exactly north of Jerusalem. But it isn't because the North Pole is the northernmost point of planet Earth. If we go over to Google Earth and find the North Pole here, it's flagged. Now if I can rotate the Earth so that we get both Jerusalem and the North Pole on the same screen, bear with me. Now we connect Jerusalem to the North Pole in a straight line. Now this line that I've drawn on screen is true north of Jerusalem. Moscow is here and it's nowhere near north of Jerusalem. In fact, none of Russia is northwards of Jerusalem. Now I want you to pay attention to this patch here. I'm going to zoom in. I need to zoom in a few times. Remember, this line on screen is true north of Jerusalem, and it cuts directly through Ankara, which is the capital city of Turkey. The Bible is phenomenally precise. Because Ezekiel 38, verse 15, talking about the Gog and Magog invasion of Israel, says, and they shall come from the north parts. Well, Ankara is directly north of Israel. So I've compiled 10 reasons why Turkey is the Gog and Magog of the Bible. Here's a few of those reasons. At number one, the seven churches in the book of Revelation were all in Turkey. At number two, for thousands of years, Satan's seat was in Turkey. That's in Revelation 2 verse 13. Here's a picture of it, and it's currently in a museum. At number three, Ankara, the capital city of Turkey, is directly north of Jerusalem, as we've uh, just seen, and that's in Ezekiel 38, 15 and 39, 2. At number four, Noah's Ark landed in the mountains of Ararat, which is in southern Turkey, the source of the river Euphrates. At number five, Persia, which is modern-day Iran, shares a border with Turkey, and that's in Ezekiel 38, 15. At number six, the fountains of waters are in southern Turkey and they feed the river Euphrates. Again, that's in uh, Revelation 16, verse 12. And a major reason why Gog and Magog is Turkey and not Russia is that the Bible says it's Turkey. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. So if I break down these verses, the chief prince is the prime minister, the president. It's universally accepted amongst Bible scholars that Meshach and Tubal are two cities at either end of Turkey. They still exist today. So Gog is the land of Turkey, Meshach and Tubal are cities within Turkey, and the chief prince is the king, the president of the whole land of Gog 
which we've identified as Turkey. If you've made it this far and you're still interested, <laughs> uh, then I've saved the best for last. I'm about to blow your mind with some information that I've discovered. So Revelation 9.16 says, And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000,000. ,000. So the number of people who invade Israel will be 200 million. But where do they come from? Ezekiel 38 verse 5 tells us where they come from. It's Persia, Ethiopia, Libya and Turkey. Here's where it gets interesting. If we add up the populations of these countries, Persia, which is modern day Iran, here, 75 million. Ethiopia, which is modern day Sudan, and according to the CIA World Factbook, the population is 45 million. Libya, 6 million. And Turkey, 75 million. Add them up and we get exactly 201 million. All these countries border with each other, exactly as the Bible says. They surround Israel, exactly as the Bible says. And the combined populations add up to 200 million, exactly as the Bible says. All these four countries are Muslim and opposed to Israel, exactly as the Bible says. And I suspect that if Damascus is attacked by Israel and becomes a, a ruinous heap, as the Bible says, then all the surrounding countries, Turkey, Persia, Ethiopia and Libya, will band together to invade Israel. After Israel gets invaded, then the attackers get nuked in retaliation. Exactly as the Bible says. Thank you for watching this video. There's a lot more information that I haven't covered in this video. Until next time, I'm Tiger Dan, a Bible prophecy addict from the UK. And the answer to 1983 AD.
Во-первых, я знаю, когда наступит конец света. I know when the world will end. The sun will turn into a white dwarf. Other things will happen too. Now, that will be the end of the world as we know it. So if this is what you mean by the end of the world, it will come even sooner. But I'm not afraid. It's inevitable. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back, and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, God and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people, against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God. It shall also come to pass, that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods, that dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day, when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old times by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? And it shall come to pass at the same time, when God shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And Jamie, there are new concerns this morning that Russia and Iran are helping Syria in its fight against the rebels. Syrian troops, it turns out, are now using sophisticated technology and tactics on the battlefield, according to analysts. And they say all that help comes from that man and his country, Tehran, as well as Moscow, all in an attempt 
to try and keep Bashir al-Assad in power. Will he hold out? Joining us now is UN Ambassador John Bolton, former ambassador to the United Nations, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and Fox News contributor. Good morning, Ambassador. Good morning, Eric. Glad to be with you. Good. We just saw uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, and apparently Iran is helping uh, Assad, Russia is helping Assad, and Secretary of State John Kerry is telling him to stop it. But is anyone listening? Well, they're not listening in Moscow and Tehran, that's for sure. Obviously, both Russia and Iran have been aiding Assad uh, during these hostilities over the last two years. I think it's one of the main reasons Assad stayed in power. But within the last several months, there seems to me to be little doubt but that Iran and uh, Russia have both stepped up the quantity and quality of the assistance that they're providing, more sophisticated communications and targeting capabilities, uh, more financial assistance, uh, bringing in Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization funded by Iran. Uh, and now, most significantly, Russia reaffirming it will sell a very sophisticated air defense system known as the S-300 uh, to Syria. When you combine that with sales of MiG planes, sales of anti-ship uh, missiles, and the deployment of uh, over a dozen additional Russian warships uh, to the Syrian uh, area of the Mediterranean, uh, all speaks of a significant Russian commitment and a significant Iranian commitment to keeping Assad in power. Apparently there are Iranian drones, there are Iranian mortar units, jamming equipment. Let's take a look at those S-300 Russian missiles. Man, oh man, if they're deployed, what does that mean for a potential no-fly zone that could be imposed by the West? Well, these, these uh, missiles and radars that comprise the S-300, uh, not necessarily the most sophisticated Russia has, but they are capable in most analyst estimation of defeating any aircraft other than stealth aircraft. Uh, Israel does not have stealth aircraft uh, at present. Obviously, NATO forces the United States do. But it dramatically escalates the uh, sophistication that's available to Syria and potentially to Hezbollah and the Baqa Valley in Lebanon to protect themselves. So it's a, it's a signal uh, militarily to Israel and the West. It's also a big political signal as well that Russia really is all in here to keep Assad in power. And it's not just those missiles. There are reports that they're going to sell more MiGs to Syria. Uh, that really does complicate the situation. Right. And I, I think it demonstrates Russia is not about to let Assad fall. So while Secretary of State Kerry has spent the last several months uh, persuading Russia to sponsor a peace conference in Syria that they can to make sure that the peace conference uh, result is preordained, namely that Assad is not going to negotiate to step out of power. I think that's been clear for a long time. The Russians do not share our interest in uh, moving Assad out. Their interest is diametrically the opposite of ours in Syria, and that's why the Obama administration's effort to join with Russia the last two and a half years has failed. Meanwhile, there's a rather blunt op-ed that former British Prime Minister Tony Blair has written in the Daily Mail in London uh, about the Muslim religion, about Assad claiming he's conducting ethnic cleansing. And look what uh, Tony Blair writes this morning. He says, there is not a problem with Islam. There is a problem within Islam. From the adherence of an ideology that is a strain within Islam, and we have to put it on the table and be honest about it. Here is a world leader coming out attacking violent extremist Islam. Your reaction? Well, I think he's a very courageous man. I've thought that for a long time. And I think, uh, I think he puts it very well in that passage you just read. It's not a problem with Islam. It's a problem within Islam. And if you're not prepared to talk about it, if you're not prepared to acknowledge the threat of radical Islamists, and the terrorist ideology that they profess, how are you ever going to be able to analyze and defend against it? I think that's one of our biggest problems here. People are afraid to, to offend Muslims generally by talking about Islamic terrorism when it's Muslims generally who are the biggest victims of Islamic terrorism. So I think uh, perhaps Blair's courage in, in the UK could be a, a, a symbol here in the United States that we do need to put this on the table and talk about it. And we've seen the attacks in London, we saw the attacks in Boston, of course. Finally, what do we do about it? Well, I think that the idea that President Obama uh, espoused at his National Defense University speech uh, two weeks ago that the war on terror is basically over is manifestly false. It, it just flies in the face of the evidence that's right in front of us. And uh, we need to put that on the table, too. We're never going to prevail over the terrorists if we don't admit they exist.
Ambassador John Bolton, thank you. As always, every Sunday for your insight. Good to see you. Thank you, Eric. Chapter 39. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel, and I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is come, and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years, so that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forests, for they shall burn the weapons with fire. And they shall spoil those that spoil them, and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord God. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto God a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. And it shall stop the noses of the passengers. And there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude. And they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them. And it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. They shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land, to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth, to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search. And the passengers that pass through the land, when any see of the men's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it, till the buriers have buried it in the valley of Haman God. And also the name of the city shall be Hamona. Thus shall they cleanse the land. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, Speak unto every feathered fowl, and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves, and come, gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty, and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of goats, of bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. And ye shall eat fat till ye be full, and drink blood till ye be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. Thus ye shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men, and with all men of war, saith the Lord God. And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed, and my hand that I have laid upon them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forth. And the heathen shall know went into captivity for their iniquity, because they trespassed against me. Therefore hid I my face from them, and gave them into the hand of their enemies. So fell they all by the sword. According to their uncleanness, and according to their transgressions, have I done unto them, and hid my face from them. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob, and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, and will be jealous for my holy name. After that they have borne their shame, and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me, when they dwelt safely in their land, and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people, and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land, and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, said the Lord God.